everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Sorry, we were just um, making sure that the webinar things were working all right. Thank you so much for coming along to this today. This is our first um, artist development session as part of the Digital Democracies programme, which is visual coding with Ashley, um, who I'll be passing you over to really briefly. I'm going to keep this short. I just wanted to say hello. Um, my name's Sam. I'm Director of Programmes for Threshold Studios. Um, we are currently running the Digital Democracies Programme, which is a two-year R&D programme, testing development of digital work in public spaces, but also as well looking at how we can develop and share digital skills amongst our creative community. Um, this workshop is the first in the series of six, which will go on between now and November. We're currently putting a web platform together for the project that will have more information. Um, and more listings of things that are coming up, uh, which is due to go live. Um, so if you keep an eye on threshold social media or frequency social media or Digital Democracies also works with two other partners in Freedom Festival and Brighton Digital Festival. So you can also keep an eye on their channels too. Um, and you'll find more information about other stuff that is coming up. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. I'm going to pass you over to Ash. She's going to explain how this is going to work. But from our side, there's also this webinar is going to be made available as a video to participants. So that will be done and sent out to you post this session today. Um, and there'll also be a survey because this is a, a beta testing and development project. So any feedback or information you can give us or share is really, really helpful to our process. Um, and yeah, I'm going to keep that really short. I'm literally going to keep it that short because I think that's all that needs to be said for the moment. If you have any questions or anything, please just put them in the chat regarding the project and we'll be happy to get back to you. Um, but I'm, I'm going to hush up now and I'm going to pass you over to Ash, who's the reason why you're here. Um, and yeah, I hope you all have a really great session. And yeah, anything we can do, just put a comment in the chat. Amazing. Thanks ever so much. Well, yeah, no, welcome everybody. Uh, so yeah, my name is Ashley. I'm a digital artist based in Coventry. Um, but as with the power of uh, Zoom, we can be connected anywhere. So I just want to say hello to wherever you are and whenever you're watching this. Currently right now, it's uh, a sort of semi sunny uh, afternoon. So uh, as Sam said, this is the first of the digital democracies. And what we're looking at today is creative coding through a kind of visual arts approach. So this is open to any any artist who's interested in exploring or experimenting with code. Uh, it's becoming more and more prevalent uh, around us, and and lots of artists are are thinking about how they can potentially incorporate that within their work. You know, beyond the kind of obvious of learning to code and make a website to show off your portfolio. This is more about. Uh, practices and ways of working. What we're going to do is we're going to use a very specific language today and an, an online editor. So, you know, there's no software to download. And, um, you know, although it's a little bit fiddly, you can use this on a, a tablet as well. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing it on your phone because uh, you won't be able to see. Um, but so that we're able to just, you know, uh, we don't need to worry about, uh, yeah, downloading anything uh, onto our screens. So, as said before, if there's any uh, questions or anything like that, please uh, pop them in the uh, chat. There's going to be various bits where I will pause, which will allow anybody who's watching this uh, back afterwards to make sure that they can see uh, the screen with the code. Uh, I know it can often be difficult trying to, especially if you're on a smaller screen, try to follow along and also type in the code at the same time. Uh, you may need to, you know, alt tab back and forth. So the pacing, uh, uh, you know, I will try my very best to ensure that there is, you know, a balance there of, uh, you know, keeping it uh, exciting, but also giving you chance to um, giving you chance to make sure that there is time to add in and, and code along as we're going along. So uh, I will share my screen and uh, we will get started. And let's 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 uh, do this. That will drop that down. And let's come right on in. Okay, so I'm just going to give everybody, let me uh, move my camera out of the way. Just going to give everybody a chance. Hopefully, uh, the link uh, to the editor that we're going to use today, uh, just in case, I'm going to post this back into the chat uh, so that there is a chance to, just so that there's a chance to, uh, oh man. 
where's the chat here it is in the q a no q a uh uh, maybe uh, maybe one of my uh, wonderful co-hosts can post that in just in case, but you should have been sent this uh, link out. It's editor.p5js.org. Um, and this is the uh, system and platform that we're going to use today. I'm going to talk you through some of the, uh, the language and the syntax, but one of the other things I really want to do today is not just teach you a bunch of words that can do stuff. It's about the computational thinking behind it. So as an artist who works with code, I've kind of been freelance for about 12 years now, um, but I started to learn to code when I was 10 years old. Um, so I, uh, you know, a misspent youth um, reading books on how to code uh, and writing it handwritten down in books until I had access to a computer. Um, but for me, what's super interesting and important is thinking about uh, the, the process, the logical thoughts that go into coding, how some of that language and process is very similar to a, a wide, diverse range of art forms. So, you know, if you're a sculptor or a painter or, you know, a costume maker or, or a variety of things, you may notice some of the language and thought process is very similar. It's just that we're using a different syntax to tell the computer what to do. So that's just as important as me teaching you actual lines of code and what that code does. Yeah. So that's that's kind of super important for me. OK. Oh, here's the here's the old chat. Excellent. Thank you very much. OK, so, yeah. One of the things that we may want to do, it's not so important now, but I guess while I'm talking, it's a useful kind of thing that you could start to do, is um, on this editor, um, uh, you can have the chance to sign up for a, a free account. And this enables you to save your work then to this uh, online account, and then you can access those uh, bits of code that you've made on another computer by logging in. What's more important is, if we want to share our work or maybe embed what we've done onto our website or you know on a variety of uh, of other kind of platforms uh, maybe you've got a squarespace or a wordpress or maybe you've built your own website and you really want to showcase the work that you've done today um, if you have an account, uh, so in the top right hand corner, um, you're able to kind of um, sign up. If you have that account, you will be able to uh, save the code and then uh, export it so that you're able to uh, embed it elsewhere. And I'll talk through some of those kind of terms later. If you don't do it now, it is important to have it done for the um, the second part of this session um, because we're going to be uh, uploading and manipulating uh, images um, and that functionality won't happen unless uh, we have an account. So it's up to you whether you do that now or, or do that later. I'll just pause for a second and then I'll go over this whole interface. I'm just going to move myself out of the way. Nice. <clears throat> okay, so very briefly, let's go to the right hand side and this settings cog here, because what a lot of you might have noticed is you've come onto this and you've seen that my screen is dark and yours is like a light gray color. And that's because I'm using the high contrast because it's easier to pick up on screens later especially as we all know uh, with Zoom lately and various other things, technology and bandwidth and the screen might get blurred as we try to rush. Uh, this kind of works really nicely for that. Uh, so if you click the settings icon, uh, I'm currently using the high contrast. Uh, you can choose the, uh, the light theme, the dark theme, whichever you like. And I've also increased the text size just so that it's a little bit easier to see. Um, a lot of the other settings I'm leaving as is. Also, if any of you have any accessibility, um, for example, if you're using screen readers, there's a few settings there. Uh, and I'll let you uh, discover those for whatever your personal needs are. I suggest leaving line numbers on, uh, as it could be useful for helping with uh, problems in code. As I've said before, I've been coding since I was 10 years old. I make spelling mistakes and code errors all the time. Um, and so th these things are very useful. And so I, I, I'm going to try and help mitigate any problems that we might have through uh, these sessions. Let's take a look at the main kind of part of this, uh, this, this website then. You'll notice that it, it's split down the, the middle. Uh, you can actually click uh, and drag this to be uh, however 
big you like, but I like to keep it in the middle. What we've got on the left hand side is where we're going to type our code. And when we run that code, the output of that code is going to appear on the right hand side where it says preview right here. This is where the things that we make are going to appear. OK, so we've got this really nice, neat side by side approach. What we've also got on the bottom is this thing called the console. Um, and this is where errors are going to appear if we type anything wrong in our code or if we try to run something and we've uh, you know, possibly made a mistake. Or what's more important is I'm going to kind of encourage you to experiment uh, and play and try things, which means you might break things. So it's OK. Um, we can just, you know, edit, undo or, you know, go go back a step. Yeah. So really, really useful. I'm just going to double check in case there's anything in the chat for anyone who needs to. OK, nothing for me. Feel free to uh, shout out if there's anything uh, specific that I need to cover. All right, then. So we have the left hand side where our code is, the right hand side where our preview is. And we have these two big buttons here. So what we're using is something called uh, processing. Uh, processing is a, a language that was created by a couple of students at MIT some well over 15 years ago. Um, and they were designers who wanted an easy way to approach working with code and working with technology uh, and processing was born and it's an open source software. So it's completely free um, and it started life as a desktop piece of software that you would download and, uh, uh, and use. And in more recent times, the P5JS is the JavaScript version, so the web-based version uh, that enables us to follow the same ethos and almost the same syntax as what processing uses, um, but in a web-based version so that we can make uh, interactive, creative things for the web. And this editor was built so that we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, uh, having our own web space, writing some code, uploading it, seeing it to work. We can test it all directly in here. This is one easy way of us accessing this. So P5.js is a JavaScript language, right? JavaScript is one of the top three languages uh, in the world. It powers most of the, you know, interactivity uh, on the web. Uh, there are tons of kind of frameworks. JavaScript itself uh, as a language has been around for a while and code to do with creative things such as drawing or manipulating media or a variety of other kind of uh, creative things like that in, in, pure JavaScript is very long winded, lots and lots and lots of lines of code. And, and from a, a beginner's perspective, or even let's say an artist's perspective, you know, we might have that higher level abstraction of thinking where I just want to, I want to have an easel that I start with and I want it to be this big. Um, what P5.js has done is taken some of those long bits of code and made them into shorter bits of code. Okay, so this is JavaScript syntax but this is specific to P5.js. If you were to use a different JavaScript kind of uh, framework, it might have its own kind of uh, syntax and code and functions as well. But ultimately you can see this idea of having curved brackets, this idea of having these kind of uh, squiggly brackets, these parentheses brackets and semicolons at the end of lines of code, these kind of, um, uh, these standards are the same across all of the JavaScript. Before we look at what any of this code does, let's make sure that this editor is working for you all in your browser, okay? This code has been typed in here by default. Usually you'd start with completely blank with nothing there. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna press the run button, the play button, yeah? Um, when, when the guys designed this, they kind of were thinking very media style. So when your code is saved, it's called a sketch. Um, uh, the, the, the output that you put stuff on, despite it being digital on screen is called a canvas. And you know, there's a lot of um, kind of art terminology there. They wanted it to feel like the same as if you were to flip open a sketch pad and just doodle, that it was the same kind of idea as when you're playing with code. So we've got this play button and this stop button. And that's because as well, lots of languages are what's called compiled. Um, so what we've written here, 
when we press the play button, that code gets turned into the zeros and ones that the computer can understand and then gives us the output. So one of the things we've got to remember as we're doing uh, what we're doing today is um, when we make any changes is to make sure we stop and press play to start the code again. Yeah, so if something isn't working for you, one of the things might be that you've typed a bunch of stuff in, but you haven't stopped it and restarted it and run the code. A couple of you eagle-eyed might notice there's something called an auto refresh there, which kind of does that process for you. But later, if we're doing some kind of code to do with uh, images and, and other bits that we might be doing, as you're typing and going along, depending on the speed of your internet or the fact that you're also watching this at the same time, so that's like a, a live stream and coding, and maybe you've got Facebook open in the background because you, know, you also wanna to chat to your mates instead of listening to me, whatever's going on, it could start to slow to a halt. So I'd, I'd, I'd encourage to not necessarily use that function um, because it's trying to auto compile every time you're typing a letter, and I don't know what computers you're using. All right, with that in mind, let's press play and see what we get now, straight away with this code, and then let's dissect it. If it's working for everybody, we should see a white square on the right-hand side. So a good pause now, just in case anybody's isn't working. But I would like to think that um, we're pretty good. I'm going to explain why and what this is and how this has appeared. The code on the left-hand side, there is a function set up. You can see that this is line one, function, and a function defines a block of code. This one is called setup, so the name of it is appearing here in blue. Processing is quite nice and visual. It gives you kind of color schemes to hint at things. So if something doesn't look quite right color-wise, that also is a little hint that things might not be okay. Anyway, then we also have this starting left parenthesis, and then you see on line three, we have this ending parenthesis, and this is like the bookends, like the start and end of that block of code. So our code has to be written between those brackets to make it work. For example, if line two was for somehow reason was written on line four instead, then this would give us an error because it's not within our function. We have a function setup, and we can see here that we have a function draw. Two separate functions. And these are inbuilt to process in, and these are um, similar in a lot of languages, I guess, but the terminology is specific to this one. When we press that play button, actually processing P5JS is looking for those functions. And if they exist, if setup exists, it will run each line of code sequentially from top to bottom from that starting bracket to the end bracket, and it's gonna run down each line of code one by one, and it's gonna do that once, and then it's gonna finish. If it finds the function draw, this is setting up the program for our loop, okay? So most programs work in a loop. They constantly go again and again and again. Most programs continue to run. And things need to happen more than once because we need to make calculations or respond to the user input or to do things with data. If the program just did line by line by line and then stopped, then nothing would happen. So this function draw is running on, in a loop and it actually runs 30 times a second. So it takes that line of code, which currently is only line six, and it's doing that line of code 30 times a second in some instances on higher level machines or you know if we're running a really beefy laptop it might be running 60 times a second and it's that's similar if anybody works in film or is interested in that games etc frames a second you know fps frames per second 30 frames per second so most computation runs with that similar idea let's take a look at these functions then we've got something called create canvas and then it's got a left and right bracket and it's got two numbers in it separated by a comma and then a semicolon at the end. Most of our code is going to follow this idea where we write a function name, which relates to a bunch of instructions, a left and right curve bracket with a semicolon at the end. And inside that are our parameters. 
yeah, things that alter how that function works. Because we don't need to write lots of code that says, if I wanted a canvas to work on that was, you know, A4 sized, and I wanted a canvas that was A3 size or A2 size, it, it wouldn't make sense to make a function for every single one of those. It would make sense to say, I would like to make a canvas and I'm going to specify how big I would like it to be. And that's what these parameters are, these numbers. And we're going to see a lot of these uh, throughout this, this very first session. So what's this 400-400? Well, when we are creating stuff on screens um, digitally, we measure in pixels, yeah? The width and height of something in pixels. So I don't know if anybody's ever stared very closely at their telly, you know, and you can see all the little tiny squares. A bit harder on your phone, of course, but um, it's all made up of those tiny pixels. And what we use is the, the, the width first, followed by the height. And this is the same with uh, making games, making websites, putting stuff on TV screens, computer screens, uh, you know, laptops, phones, etc. It all follows this similar idea. OK, and I'm going to take you back to your maths school now because it's actually a coordinate system. So let's just start. What we, I'm saying is make this canvas 400 pixels wide. Always the width first, yeah? Let's remember that. Always the width across first, which is also known as the X position. And then the height afterwards, so 400 pixels high, which is also known as the Y position, okay? So it's really useful to remember that, the X and the Y. Let me, before I change that, let me just show you something that we can do in this code that could be useful as we're going along. I'm just going to press enter at the end of that line two. And on line three, I'm going to put in a double slash. I'm going to put in a double slash and you'll notice that this is gray. And anything I type in here is now a comment. So width, then height. I can type in anything I like in here and you'll notice that it's gray. This is a comment to me. This is to remind me maybe what does that code do or Maybe I'd just like to leave a little note for myself in the code. As long as there's the double slash and it's in gray, when we press that play button, the computer ignores it. Okay, so this is just useful as we're going along. I don't know how you all like to work. Maybe you'd like to make notes on big bits of paper. I like to do that too. Maybe you want to make notes uh, also, you know, in, in Notepad or Word or something like that. Or maybe you want to put them in the code. I'm just trying to show you ways in which might help you along. Right, let's let's make our canvas bigger then. Why not make it uh, 600 pixels wide? So we can just change that number to 600 and we can press play and immediately notice that our canvas is now stretched and it's bigger. These numbers specify the exact number of pixels um, and, and we can have any combination that we like. 600 by 600. There we go, starting to get bigger. I think 800 by 800, a nice kind of... About this is that we could type in here numbers that could be much, much bigger, for example. So we could um, create work on this little screen here. And if we were to then put our laptop into a much bigger screen, like a 4K screen, we could alter those numbers so that it fits how big we want that screen to be. So that's our first function, setting up the size. You'll notice that the background, the, the color of this is white, you know, same as if we click file new in Word or something or paint or whatever we're using. And that's this code here, line seven. Line seven is specifying the background and background sets the color. Just going to pause there and think, does anyone know what the three colors are that we use when we are specifying color combinations in code? This is the same as if we're designing for the web or, you know, it can be similar if we're designing for print as well. Anyone who's used Photoshop, things like that might know these. 
What they are is the red, the green, and the blue values, otherwise known as RGB. And again, if you stare really closely at your TV screen, not for too long, you'll hurt your eyes. Um, but if you stare really closely at a TV screen, you'll see those tiny little pixels and see that they're made up of those colors. So a red, a green, and a blue. I'm just gonna uh, put myself a little comment in there. RGB, to remind myself that this is a red, a green, and a blue value. And what are those values? I mean, that's just 220. What does that mean? That's intangible at the moment. Think of it as like mixing paint. Yeah, our values actually start at zero, which means no amount of that color. And the maximum amount of color is 255. So if we click inside here and where it says 220, let's try changing this to make this a red background. So I'm gonna put in maybe uh, 255 worth of red, put a comma, I'll put no green, comma, and no blue. So I'm gonna use a zero, all the red, all the green, all the blue. Ah, it hasn't changed. Why is that? Ah, remember, I said we've got to press the stop button and press play to run it again. Great. I've got a red background now. It's a bit bright, but it looks okay. What we can do is mix and much color combinations here. And this is where we can go to trusty old Google if we uh, don't remember or are not quite as nerdy as me and know lots of RGB color combinations. For example, if we wish to have pink and so on and so forth. Have a little experiment for a couple of minutes on trying to make these lots of different colors. See if you can get orange, see if you can get green, see if you can get a light blue. What about yellow? Maybe try and find your favorite color. Like I say, you can also use an RGB color value, which you can find on Google as well. See what color value makes black and what makes white. And how does this differ from mixing paint? Let's just have one minute doing that. And some of those things, I'm just gonna recap and write on a bit of paper behind me. Okay, if anybody's found some really interesting colors or things that you really like, please do drop them in the chat. Um, I'd be very interested to see. Okay, that's a little bit light. I'm gonna go with a slightly light gray. I'll go with a slightly light gray rather than a pure black background. So it's different, isn't it? It's really interesting that uh, if we use zero, 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 that gives us a black. So no amount of any color gives us black and the full amount of every color gives us white. And this is different to paint mixing, but this follows light properties. Yeah, we're, we're a little mini physics lesson here. We're actually mixing light colors together, which is why it's red, green and blue rather than the uh, paint colors. Okay, so uh, we've got our canvas. We can play around with the size. We can play around the color. Mm, let's get drawing some stuff on here now. Let's think about how we can draw some shapes on here. This is a coordinate system, our canvas is. Uh, it's, it's 800 pixels wide by 800 pixels tall, meaning that if we want to draw something on there, we need to specify those pixels. We need to tell the computer how many pixels are long, and how many pixels down we want to start drawing our shape. Uh, and this is the same whether we're drawing shapes, whether we're drawing pictures, things like that. And this is like what web designers have to do, games designers, things like that. 
So it's a coordinate system. And I just said that we start um, at the top and we go along the width, which is the X position. And we go down the height, which is the Y position. So whenever we're doing that, we start at zero, zero in the top corner. OK, uh, so if you remember your old maths days where we used to have to draw like a nice little grid with zero, zero, and we were able to move stuff around. Yawn, that was boring. This is hopefully going to be a little bit more interesting. So we want to draw a shape at a position. So 800 across and 800 down would be the bottom corner and zero, zero would be the top corner. So by, by that, we can start to think, and, and I like to draw this down because, you know, it's just easier. We can go along 800 and down zero, which will give us the other top corner. And we can go zero across and down 800 to give us the other corner. So we can start to specify the four corners. And if we wanted to go in the middle of the screen, what numbers would we use? Yeah, that's right. We can go 400 across, 400 down, and that puts us in the middle. Let's do that. Let's draw a circle in the middle of the screen. Yeah, I know it's not super exciting, but let's do it. I'm going to come down after I've made this comment in line eight, and I'm going to press enter and make uh, a new line. OK, so I'm still inside this bracket. One thing I'm not going to do is come after this bracket and start typing some code here because it's not going to work. We've got to make sure we're inside. OK. The command to draw a circle is called ellipse. Let's make sure we spell this right. E-L-L-I-S-P. I always spell it wrong. Hang on. Ellipse. There we go. And it's gone blue, thankfully. So I know I've spelt it correctly. Left and right curve bracket and a semicolon. That's the function to draw a circle. And it's going to need some numbers inside, starting to see how this works. And what it needs is the first number is how far along and the second number is how far down. So let's draw it in the center. So we're going to do 400, 400. We're going to need another comma because now I want to specify how wide I would like to draw that circle in pixels. And the fourth number is how tall I would like to draw that circle in pixels. So again, we follow this convention, always, always across and then up and down. So let's make it uh, 50 pixels wide by 50 pixels tall. And let's run this code and see what happens. It's a little bit tiny. Let's maybe make it 150 wide by 150 tall. That's better, a little bit bigger. So we can, we can start to use these numbers. Let's make it 250 wide. Great, now I've got some kind of oval shape. Let's make it 350 wide. Let's make a flying saucer. Eh, not quite, but you know. This parameters that we can change will allow us to alter what's happening with this circle. I, I'm gonna go for a, a nice perfect circle just to keep it nice and neat. So those last two numbers are the width and height. The first two numbers are the position. So currently what we've done is we've gone across 400. We've gone down 400, which is the center point of the circle. And then we've said drawn that circle 400 wide. So it's actually 200 pixels on either side because it's the diameter, not the radius. And then, sorry, 350 wide and 350 tall. Okay. Maybe we want to put it somewhere else. Let's not go 400 across. Let's go 100 across instead. Great. We can see that it has now changed and being drawn in a different place. And of course, we don't have to just draw one circle. You know, we can copy this again. Ellipse. Let's draw another one. 300 across, 400. Let's make this one smaller. And we can start to build up. And we can start to draw pictures uh, on the screen by drawing lots of shapes. So that enables us to draw a circle. You'll notice that a bit like the background, um, we, we'd set the background to be a specific color. Um, we haven't actually set what color we should draw these shapes in. 
Uh, and this is um, a, an interesting way in which we have to think, um, because as some might say to me, oh, maybe we just put some extra three numbers on the end, which is for the red, green and blue values, or, or maybe we just, and, and it's a different way of thinking. What we have to actually do with P5JS is we have to tell the computer what color we would like to set our, our, our paint bucket, if you like, and then going forward, all shapes will be filled with that color. So it's a little different. We set the color first, then every shape we draw after that is in that color. Because remember I said, this is sequential. Yeah, so it does each line of code and then it loops back around. So right now this is drawing the background and then it's drawing that circle, then it's drawing that circle and then it's gonna come back around. So what we need to do is specify the color first. And what's good about that is we can specify the color, draw a shape. Then if we want, specify a different color and draw another shape and so on and so forth to give us that control. Let's see how that works. Let's, let's make this uh, big circle, the first one, um, one specific color. The command to do this is called fill. I might have hinted to it earlier when I said, let's fill a shape with a color. What you'll get with processing uh, and P5JS when you're working along is you might be able to just think about what something you might like to do. I would like to draw a triangle and the function might exist and be called exactly what you're thinking. Not always, not always, but a lot of times that there are. And this leads itself to great experimentation and play. So we're gonna use the fill command left and right bracket and a set semicolon at the end. And inside here, we use the same colors idea. We use the red, the green and the blue RGB values that go from naught to 255. So let's make this green, for example, or you please do pick something nicer. I'm gonna fill this with zero amount of red, comma, a full amount of green, and just to be funky, I'll put in a small amount of blue. Again, I'm not gonna see this until I stop and run the code. Hey, it's green, but both of them are green. And that's because I've set the fill command, drawn this circle, drawn this circle. So if I want that one to be a different color, whereabouts do I need to put the code? That's right, before I draw the other circle. I'm actually gonna leave a, a blank line in between to, to remind myself uh, that these are different. I'll set that fill command. Maybe I'll draw this pink, why not? And semicolon at the end. Let's run this again. Hey, great. I can now draw different shapes in different sizes, in different positions with different colors. Already we've now started to get something that we could start to build some uh, kind of collages. You know, we could start to layer these circles up. Hey, Kandinsky, eat your heart out, we'll make some digital versions and, uh, you know, uh, and start to think like that. There's a couple of other little things that uh, I would like to do before we have a little experiment with some of these things. And that is, let's just look at how we can draw a rectangle because it's different to how we draw a circle. So rectangles will allow us to draw, funnily enough, rectangles and squares, uh, but they are not drawn from a center point. They are actually drawn starting in the top left corner, a bit similar to how our screen is. So we specify the width along and the height down to start, and then our rectangle comes off from that top left corner. To demonstrate that, I'm going to use the middle of the screen for that. So I'm gonna use the rectangle command, which you'll start to know this, coders do get a bit, uh, <clears throat> some people say lazy, I say efficient, uh, where we don't need to type in all these long words all the time. So we just use rect for short, left and right curve bracket and a semicolon. We want the fastest possible way. Efficient is a good word, I like that. And so the rectangle is, how many pixels along, how many pixels down? I'm gonna do 400, 400, so that you can see what I mean by the fact that it draws it from the top corner. And I'm gonna specify this to be 200 pixels wide and 100 pixels tall. 
So there we go. You can see that we've gone 400 across, 400 down, which is this top point here. We've drawn our rectangle 200 long and 100 down. And our rectangle is pink because it inherits the color from before. We made the color green, draw a circle. Color pink, draw a circle, draw a rectangle. If we want to change the color, we can just put another fill command in there to make that a different color. Let's make that blue. Great. Okay, so we've drawn circles, we've drawn rectangles and squares. Some of you may have noticed, and um, I don't think no one's put it in the chat. No, that's good. What you may have noticed is that there is a black outline around these shapes by default. So processing has a lot of things that are just standard by default and if you don't overwrite them by changing that code they just there they just exist for our benefit yeah what if we don't like that or what if we do like it but we want a nice thick outline or heaven forbid we want like a different colored one i mean try not to hurt your eyes on this one but we could have different colored outlines as well it's the same kind of code for also if we want to draw just a line on the screen. So I'm gonna cover those two bits now. You can see that our code is starting to fill up on the left-hand side. So be very careful now, I'm gonna press enter a couple of times and our scroll bar has appeared so we can scroll up and down. I'm just making sure that I haven't gone past my outside bracket, yeah? I wanna make sure that I'm still inside my function. So let's have a look at drawing a line and then let's have a look at what options we can use to set the stroke, which is the line, the thickness and the color, which is for drawing just lines, but also is applied to the outline of shapes. Okay, so if we wanna draw a line, <laughs> the function is line. Ah, great design there. So line is our function. And it's going to take four numbers. Maybe some people are starting to think and are invisibly shouting at me at the screen. I know, I know. There are four numbers that we need. If we wish to draw a line between two points on the screen, we're going to need two sets of coordinates. The first width and height, the X and Y position, and the second width and height position. So let's just, uh, I'm going to throw in any old random numbers now. Let's draw it from between 200 and 200. And I'm going to draw it to 600 and 600. A line straight across the screen. Why not? Let's see what that looks like. There we go. I've got a line across the screen. Well, I mean, we're getting to the point now where we could print this out and hang this up and be very happy with our abstract art. But let's, let's, let's keep going and do some more. So that's how we draw a line between an X and Y position and another X and Y position. 200, 200, across by 600, down by 600. So we can change that as well. If I want to make that a different color, it's not the fill command because a fill is for a shape. And this is just a line. It does not have um, uh, you know, a, a, a solid shape. So if I wish to change that command, that's actually the stroke command. So before I draw the line, maybe I'd like to make that line red. So if I use the stroke command, left and right bracket, semicolon, you're getting the hang of it by now, RGB values, three numbers to make it a specific color. Let's do 25500. Zero, zero. That's gonna make that line red. Great stuff. But here's the thing. Why has every other outline gone red? Interesting. Let's have a little think for a moment. I, I, I didn't tell this shape to be like that. And I didn't tell any of these. I, I just put that line of code in there to make that red and then draw a line. Why is everything else like that? Ah, okay. Well, that is because when I get to the bottom of this function, line 22, I'm going to go back around to the top and continue drawing these shapes again and again. And nowhere else have I reset the stroke color back to just a black color. So once it's been changed, I'm going to loop back around and it's going to stay the same. Right. Okay. 
So maybe up here on line nine, I should set the stroke to be a black color so that every other shape has a black outline and only that one line has a red outline. Right, okay, so now I'm really thinking why. We're in a loop here. There's nothing really to tell us that, we've just got to kind of remember. That line though, eh, it's a bit thin. What if I wanna draw a big thick line? How do I change the size of that? Well, it's a separate function again. It's not something that we can just put into those numbers. And this is actually stroke weight. Make sure I spell this correctly. There we go. And by default, it's currently only one pixel. It's one pixel thick. I could make it 10 pixels thick. Make sure I put a semicolon at the end. I could make this 10 pixels thick. Let me draw that and see what happens. Oh, that's looking nice. Oh, but because I haven't set it back to normal, every outline has been drawn that thickness. Okay. Um, right okay so i'm gonna have to also if i wish if i want to i'll reset on line 10 i'll reset the stroke weight back to one pixel and every other shape will just have a thin outline but this one is a thick outline i'm just going to pause for a second on that code for anyone who's following along uh, afterwards rather than live but you can see that the code is being executed one line after the other one thing I'd also like you to note is that order determines the layering. For anyone who's used Photoshop and things like that, you're used to like layering or whether it's visual or fine arts, you layer things up. These are being done sequentially, which means whichever has been done first, any subsequent ones are appearing over the top. So if we wanted this line to be behind that blue rectangle, we would have to move these lines 17 and 18 and do them after we've drawn that line. So we can think about layering and ordering by moving our code to be in certain positions. What we're going to do now is something that they always remind you to do at school all the time is we're going to file save our work, whether uh, hopefully you've kind of had a chance to log in. But if you click in the top bar, there should be file, edit, sketch and help. If we click on file, you should be able to press the save button if uh, if, if we're logged in. Um, and But before we do, your sketch has been automatically given a name. Mine is called Upbeat Kiss. Well, there we go. That's interesting for a Wednesday. I'm going to click the little pencil icon, Complex Gambler. There's an AI algorithm that makes these uh, names and uh, they can be pretty funny. Uh, I'm going to save this as uh, our DD for Digital Democracies uh, first sketch. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to share these code sketches uh, with all the participants uh, in a link at the end that will come uh, via threshold. Okay, so DD for sketch. What I'd like you to do is um, uh, a quick five minutes break before we move on, or you can um, experiment and play. Uh, I'm just gonna grab a glass of water and we're gonna move on to looking at how we can now start to make this interactive and start to bring it alive uh, and uh, animate it and move it around. So I will be back in uh, just two minutes time. Uh, I will leave my screen sharing so that you can still see uh, and copy along. Any problems or anything like that, please pop it in the chat and I'll look at that when I'm back in just a second. <clears throat> All right, everybody. Uh, hopefully everyone took a little break and stuff and had a bit of an explore and experimentation. Uh, there's no questions in the chat, which is uh, useful. <laughs> good, good, good. Hopefully everything's running OK for everybody. Um, what we're going to look at is um, we're going to start to look at how, uh, interactivity and using uh, the mouse and the keyboard for how we can control and do things uh, within code as well. So that we can start to build up some kind of drawing tool uh, and we can start to look at um, yeah a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, but even with these kind of basic things, we can start to uh, build and create um, we can build and create our own uh, works there. I'm actually going to start with um, uh, uh, a new 
kind of sketch. So again, I just want to make sure that we've file saved this sketch just to make sure that the sketch has saved and that it's done, which is great. When we do, you might have just seen that little notice come up, auto save, which is pretty handy in case we accidentally press the back button on our browser and lose everything, or for some reason, something else happens with our computer. I'm gonna do file new, which is great, and start again afresh, just because it really helps me um, keep things uh, neat and tidy. Uh, and this is gonna be our second kind of sketch. I'm gonna change and make my canvas 800 by 800. And this time, um, no, again, I'm going to keep it to a kind of dark gray looking background. And I'm going to press play and make sure it works. Fantastic. All right, now this isn't a test, of course, um, but let's draw a white circle in the center of the screen, remembering what we've learned so far. So inside, after we've drawn the background, I'm going to use the fill command. 255, 255, 255, and I'm going to draw a circle in the middle of the screen, 400, 400, and I'm going to make this 150 pixels by 150 pixels. Great stuff. Excellent. Okay, so what now if we want to start to um, alter um, this this shape using um, mouse uh, mouse input as interactivity. I'm actually going to kind of uh, show you sort of how almost pretty much the kind of same way in which a mouse pointer is drawn on the screen. And as we kind of move left and right and up and down, that mouse uh, cursor is drawn. We're actually going to do something very similar um, with this circle here right now. One of the things I'm just going to quickly ask you is, let me press stop. When I press play, how many circles are being drawn on the screen right now? It's an interesting thought. Who said one? Uh, who said a hundred? Who said a thousand? Um, it's really interesting because who said it's drawing 30 of them every second? Aha! Gold star! No, no, I, I haven't got a gold star. Um, but you're absolutely right in the fact that, remember I said that this is drawing, doing each line of code and then it's repeating it again and again and it's doing it 30 times a second. And this is drawing that circle 30 times a second at the same position. So because this position isn't changing, whilst this is looping round, these circles are all just being laid on top of each other, okay? So what I'm gonna do is introduce the mouse so that we can get that value in 30 times a second, listen for that value, that input that's coming in and take that input and use it to control where the position is. There's a few kind of abstract thoughts there. And so the easiest way is to, uh, is to demonstrate this through the code itself. So our mouse then, just a uh, quick school lesson here, physical device. And when I move this left and right, you will say, yeah, the mouse pointer moves left and right. We've actually got to go one step lower in abstraction than that. Actually, when we move the mouse left and right, a number is being changed in the computer. And when we go to the left, that number is getting smaller. And when we go to the right, that number is getting bigger. It's also the same as when we go up and down. That is also a value and a number that is changing. That's all that's happening is these two numbers are just changing, getting bigger and smaller. And then the computer takes those numbers and applies them to the horizontal position on the screen and the vertical position on the screen. And then it draws a little tiny arrow at that position. You know, uh, anyone who's interested in reading about Adam Kay and the kind of design around this, a very, very interesting kind of uh, design and thought process behind it. But if the mouse being moved left and right is just a number. And we already know that inside drawing this circle 
how far along we draw it, we're currently drawing it 400 pixels along, is also just a number that we know we can change. I can draw this at 100 and it draws it there. I can draw it at 600 and it draws it there. What if I was able to get that number from the mouse going left and right and swap it for that number instead? Surely it would read the number from the mouse and draw the circle at that position and keep updating that because 30 times a second it's listening. And this is some of the basics around input and output. We have an input coming in. In this instance, it's a physical device. It's converted into numbers, that, that, that physical motion. And then we do something with those numbers, yeah? And in a lot of art forms and practice, we, we have that kind of system going on. Processing has an inbuilt uh, variable. Yeah, and I'm going to talk more about variables uh, in a bit, but it has an inbuilt variable. So instead of writing 600 there in that first thing, I'm actually going to write something called mouse X with a capital X. And you'll notice it's changed to pink. That's a recognized thing. And what that is, is that is the number of when you are moving the mouse left and right. So if I press play now, we can see that the, the, the circle's over there. But if I move my mouse pointer left and right, we can see that the circle is now being drawn at the position of the mouse. Very excellent. Okay. So what about if I go up and down? Nothing's happening yet. Can we figure out what we might need to do? Yeah, let's stop this code. And instead of drawing it at 400, Let's change that to be mouse Y. And now I can move, move in inverted commas, the circle around the screen. Obviously the, uh, there's a bit of blur in there from the frame rate. What it's actually doing is get the position of the mouse and draw the circle at that position. 30 times a second, listen. Listen for those numbers, draw a circle at those numbers. Listen for those numbers, draw a circle at those numbers. And therefore, as I move the mouse around, the circle seemingly moves around, but it's just the fact that it's being redrawn again and again and again. How could we uh, also kind of visualize and, uh, uh, and kind of see what's going on there? Well, um, currently, our background is also being redrawn. This is something we didn't talk about before. Actually, let, let's really think about this code. Draw the background, i.e. set the background to be this dark gray and then draw a circle at that position. Draw the background and then draw a circle at that position. What if we stop drawing the background? Hmm, that could be interesting. What if we just draw the background once? Draw the background once and then forever draw the mouse. Okay, that's that sounds that sounds interesting. Okay, so if we remember rightly, our function setup, this creates the canvas. This, this function runs the code once. So let's 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 not draw our background inside the draw. Let's, let's, let's delete it, take it out of there. Let's draw it inside function setup after we've done the canvas. Feel free to copy and paste or move it around if you wish. I'm just uh, uh, typing it in. Okay, so now if I run this code, create the canvas, create the background once, and then now in the function draw, constantly listen to where the mouse pointer is and draw that shape at that position. Hey, super fun. We've made our own little drawing tool. It's the world's worst Microsoft Paint tool, but you know what? It's our tool and we made it. One of the great things about code is it frees you from the constraints of other software. You can build your own kind of tools and, and processes, you know? Um, hey, we know we don't have to draw this as a white circle. Uh, let's draw it as a pink circle instead. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. Um, 
I, I, I'm, what if we want it to have a really big, uh, what if we want it to have a really big um, outline? Stroke weight 10. Yeah. What if we wanted to draw a square instead, like anything that uh, can can follow follow the mouse? Uh, let's you know we could draw a, draw a rectangle instead. We could draw a different color if we so wish. Hmm. I've got a really interesting thought here now. So far, this code that we've been using, we've been putting numbers in to specifically specify parameters. Yeah. So th this fill command, that's the red amount. This, this one here, that's the green amount. This one here, that's the blue amount. This was our X position of our circle, but we, we, we've got the value of the mouse. Let's think a little bit abstract here now, because remember I said the mouse moving is just a number changing. Ooh, if, if, if I move the mouse and that can change some numbers, well, I don't have to be boring and just draw the circle at that position. Could I, could I change some of these other numbers to use that? Yes, you could. What if instead of drawing that at 150, I decided to draw this based on the mouse position? So now when I move up and down, this alters the size of the circle. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. That gives us something that's a little bit experimental. Um, hey, surely I can do that here as well in the X position. So, yeah, now it's going to change shape wherever I am. Oh, hang on then. Does that mean I can also do that in the in, in the color? Yeah, you can. Okay, let's let's have a minute or two experimenting and playing um, because maybe I'll use the mouse position to control the red amount. Oh, that's pretty cool. It's going from blue to pink as I go left and right. It's completely changing. Uh, yeah. And what if maybe up and down is going to give me the, the the blue amount? Okay, this is this is crazy now. Right now we can start to do some fun stuff. That, I mean, we did the basics before using the mouse pointer to draw a circle where the mouse is. I mean, that's you know that's that's something we would expect from that. Now we're going to do something that's a little bit different. One of the great things about playing with code is that you can experiment and play. You can try some stuff. And, 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 and as an artist who uses computational tools, it can lead to all sorts of unpredictable and interesting results. Yeah, one of the greatest things is being able to create these things and play. There are no accidents in code, you know, um, as long as it works. Um, as long as the code runs, it's the, you know, everything is there for, for fun and experimentation. Well, I mean, that's that that that's great. That's like a really interesting kind of concept and idea. Um, but it could start to get a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit crazy. Um, I'm just going to reset the color a moment just because I want to demonstrate uh, something else to you. And I'm just going to make the stroke weight a little bit uh, smaller. And I'm just going to make the circle a specific size. So right now I'm just drawing with a pink, pink circle. One of the things we could do is start to introduce choice in code. Okay, so when we learn coding, um, choices in code, like uh, selection, uh, if we were doing GCSE now, this would be under the sequencing, selection and sorting. Um, uh, this idea of how can I make a choice in code like, for example, some of you might have thought, oh, OK, if I can get the mouse position, can I get if I'm clicking the button? Yes. Yes, we can. And this would allow us to be like, OK, what if I'm pressing the button? It's going to do one thing. And if I'm not pressing the button, it's going to do something else. Here's a good time for me to also, uh, you may have noticed I have a, a tab open. Um, I'm just going to jump across to that for a second. I've got um, the P5JS website open. So we've been using the editor, but they also have a main website, p 
p5js.org and there is a reference. So if you just go to p5js.org, which is the main website, there is a reference on the side and most code languages have a reference, an API documentation. And in that reference is where they list every possible function that you could use. Now, I didn't want to overload you because this is definitely where you go at the end of this. <laughs> Once four o'clock comes and you've had enough, but then maybe later you're super excited and want to try some other stuff. Maybe you want to play with text. Maybe you want to try 3D stuff. Um, this is where you can come in and have a bit of a look about all of the possible things that exist. So maybe you're thinking to yourself, yeah, it'd be really cool if I could get, if I'm pressing the mouse, but uh, I, I'm not sure what is the syntax to do that. What's important is, is the thought process and we can find the syntax. So uh, while I'm here, let's, let's demonstrate that and look down. Oh, here we go, mouse. There's a load of stuff here, crikey, crikey. Well, um, well, this is this is interesting because I've got mouse clicked, released, pressed, dragged. Okay, um, there, there, there's a lot of different things in here. Um, let's take a look at this. Mouse is pressed. That sounds interesting. Ah, okay. So if the mouse is pressed, do something else. We'll do something else. This is the code that we're going to use. Uh, and let's take a look at that right now. So let's come back. Let's think that if we press the mouse, let's draw a different color. And if we don't press the mouse, then it will stay as this pink color. We're gonna introduce some new syntax now, uh, especially if you've looked at uh, that reference bit as well. Um, we're gonna be introducing some little mini sections of code within this. So remember these, these left and right parentheses, these kind of bookends to our function. Sometimes when we're doing choices in code, we're gonna also do those little blocks and we've gotta make sure we put our code within the start and end, otherwise it's not gonna work as we expect it to. The code might be not have a problem and still run, but it won't work as we, the user, expect it to do. Uh, and there's a difference between um, writing code that the computer thinks is a problem versus what we think is a problem. I'm going to come in and um, on line eight here within my code. Uh, for anyone who's uh, looking and using the line numbers and following along. And I'm going to start with this if statement. So whenever we want to make a choice, we do an if. If, and then we ask the computer a question, and the computer tells us, is that true or is that false? It can only be one or the other with an if statement. Yes, that is true. You do this. And then if you set up an else statement, if it's false, then it will do that other thing instead. So we want to say if, and then we're gonna have a left and right curve bracket here, if, and then the code was mouse is pressed. Then at the end, I'm going to use this left and right parenthesis brackets, different to what I've used. It's not a semicolon here because we're making a little kind of a statement that's checking and then there'll be a block of code that happens. So if mouse is pressed, we're going to do something. Then after that bracket, we're going to then say else, and then we're going to have another block. Okay, so this is our structure here. And can we see um, the P5JS edit is really useful if we kind of click and hold over each one. Uh, it kind of highlights the start and end for us so we can see that we're making sure everything's correct. All right then, so if the mouse is pressed, uh, let's do, uh, let's uh, put these three lines of code. Uh, I'm just going to, um, just gonna uh, cut them and paste them inside. Made a bit of a mess there. I like my code nice and neat. So if I press the mouse, Let's set the, uh, the outline to be three, the color to be pink and draw a circle at the position. Else, well, currently nothing. Well, let's actually test this and make sure this works before we start doing anything else. So I'm gonna press play. 
And if I move my mouse over here, nothing is happening. And that's because our else statement is happening. Is the mouse pressed? No, it's not. So therefore we're running this line 14 and line 14 is do nothing. Now, if I click, it's gonna draw the circle because that is correct. Mouse is pressed is true. This enables me to click or hold down and draw. Well, now we're getting something that's a little bit more like Microsoft Paint. I mean, it's still a bit bigger and it's, you know, but we've got our own interactive drawing tool. Let's, uh, yeah, now I can start to draw Whee. and make some interesting patterns and choices. Well, that could be funky. Or we could put something else in here that also draws a different shape if we weren't clicking the mouse. I'll leave that entirely up to you. But if you wanted something different, you could easily put in here a different fill command. And you could put in uh, the ellipse if you wished, or a rectangle, mouse Y, maybe it's tiny. I don't know, the, 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 choice, the choice is yours. So now if I move, it's just drawing these. And if I click, it's gonna do something different. It's not exactly the best artistic choice, uh, but it's really visually very obvious to see that something different is happening. I'm actually going to just leave this empty because I quite like the idea that it will only do something if I press the mouse. What about starting afresh again? What if I wanted to, to you know, clear all of that and start again? Uh, it's a question I get often because computationally it's, it, it's not that you can just clear it. Um, we can press stop and we can press start again. But what if we were able to just press the keyboard, press the space bar on the keyboard and that would clear everything, you know, like proper kind of editing and creating. So that brings us on to um, how we can use the keyboard. It also brings us on to how we can use other functions outside of this setup and this draw. So I'm gonna come right to the very, very end of my code where this last curve bracket is for the function draw. And I'm gonna press enter a few times and I'm going outside now. So I'm going outside of those two things that were already there. And I'm gonna make our own new function, okay? I'm gonna say function key pressed with a lowercase k capital P, left and right curve bracket and a left and right parenthesis. So I've now got a third function. I had a setup, I had a draw, and now I've got this key pressed function. What this is, this is basically, um, again, when I press play, processing was looking for the setup, it was looking for the draw. And there's a whole bunch of other functions it's looking for as well. And this key pressed it's looking for, Anytime I press a key on the keyboard, so if I click on here and do this, anytime I press a key on the keyboard, whatever line I code I write here in line 22 is gonna run. Um, this is what's called like in, in web dev stuff and, and real job, this is called event listeners. So this is where we make a bit of code that says, wait for this thing to happen. So keep listening for this thing to happen. And when it does, this is what I want you to do. Kind of like a cause and effect thing. When when this statement or when this thing happens, so it's again a bit like an if statement. Whenever this is going to be happening, this is what I want you to do. So event listeners, listening and waiting for something to happen, and then it's going to run this block of code. So how do we clear the background? Um, it's an interesting one to think about, but um, we, we've kind of already come across it actually what we can do is just redraw the background. Um, we're, not, we're not really getting rid of anything that's existed because we've just drawn it and put it on the screen. But if we just clear the background again by, by just redrawing it using the background command, 
it's actually going to just empty the screen. To prove that, I'm just going to draw that um, in a very bright kind of color for now, in a bright red, just to prove this is working. And then I'll set it back to the same color as what I initially used in the beginning. So let's run this code. I can click and draw. I can move the mouse and nothing happens. And then if I press the space bar, for example, I've redrawn the background in a different color. And all the rest of my code still works. Great stuff. What we have now is a kind of keyboard mouse interaction. You'll notice I'm not checking which specific key I've pressed. Um, again, uh, if anyone's interested in that, you can look into that um, in the reference, but you would use an if statement to find out whether the key you'd pressed matched, uh, say, the letter A or the letter B. But I won't come into that now. I'm just going to set that color to be the same color, 60, 60, and 60. Okay, so now this should look more I'll draw, I'll draw. I don't like that, I'll press the space. There we go. Sorry, I zoomed in by tapping my mouse. I'll draw and I'll draw. There we go. So I've got a kind of uh, nice little interactive drawing tool. Great. One thing that uh, we haven't talked about is um, the fact that we're currently drawing solid colors. We are, and if we want something to look a bit more interesting, we really want to add some kind of layers of opacity in there. So same as when we're working with Photoshop and we can add like layers or, you know, if we were, uh, if we were young and crafting with tissue paper, we could build up our layers, you know, anything like that. The same way as a painter would, you know, we can do that too. Um, how we can add that in is we can ha add what's called an alpha layer, an opacity layer, and it's called the alpha. And actually, it's not another function. It's not something we need to add separately. What we can actually do is go back to our RGB, our red, green, and blue values. And anywhere where we're using that, we can actually add a fourth number. A fourth number, which is our opacity, our alpha layer. So let's take a look. Line 10, I'm doing the fill command. I'm giving it that much red, that much green, that much blue. So far, I haven't specified the alpha, and that's because, like I said before a few times, P5 puts in some default values. So if I press the comma, what we can actually do now is add in a fourth value. We can override that. And the, and the alpha goes, it's exactly the same. It goes from naught, which is completely invisible, to 255, which is solid, which is the default. So if I put something like 90 in, for example, this is going to make that semi-transparent. As you can see, I can click and drag, and you can see it's slightly transparent. Maybe I want to make that even lower transparency. Nice. So now I can start to build up a level of transparency and start to draw something again a little bit interesting and different there's loads of things that you could start to do uh, now with layering to build up something uh, that's slightly more interesting than this and the stroke color uh, also has so right now the stroke color is really solid but we can also add um, that in the opacity as well Okay, what I'd really like to do now is add some kind of uh, fun chaos into the mix here, okay? A digital artist's best friend is a bit of randomness, yeah? Uh, throw in a few things to, to the wind. Ah, maybe I don't want it to be pink. Maybe I want to let the computer decide what color my shape might be. Um, and this is where I'm going to start to show you variables, which are values that we can store uh, at, that we can uh, both uh, overwrite and change, and we can also read and retrieve. So think of these as like a filing cabinet where we can store a value and later we can get it out. And we can also scribble it, overwrite it and put it back. 
um, and how we can add some um, randomness to that using random numbers to give us uh, something really interesting um, as well. Let's start with something completely random, but before we do, I'm going to make sure I save this. Uh, this is Hulking Kingfisher. Okay, DD sketch two, and this is interactive. File save, fantastic. Okay, cool. There we go. We've got something going on like this now. All right, so what if I wanted uh, these colors to be completely random? So we've already seen that I can give them specific numbers. We've seen that I can use the mouse because that's a changing value of numbers to alter that as well. But what if I want to like, you know, roll a 255 sided dice, pick out a number and put that in to that value instead? OK, well, what we're going to look at is some variables. So a variable that we can create, give it a name that we can reference it by, store a number in it and then read whatever number is stored in that variable. There's two ways you can do variables when you're coding, uh, something called global and something called local. I'm actually going to use global variables. Um, so that we can manipulate them on any possible bit within a program. Local variables are usually used where you just want to use them in that tiny instance, and then you don't want the computer to store that in memory ever again. It makes no difference. If we think about things from, a let's say, a video game perspective, for example, a global variable is something that needs to happen no matter what level you're on. So, for example, like maybe your health, your lives, uh, your score. These things need to stay no matter what, what game level you're in or whether you're at the beginning, the middle, end. That's a value you need to constantly have available to you to either take away from or add to. Um, things that might be local variables that are only specific, like in a game, specific to that particular level. We don't need to hold in memory you know, that particular boss's health level, it's only relevant within that one. Uh, I come from coding when I was 10, which, you know, is uh, the 80s. And we didn't have a lot of memory. We didn't have a lot of storage space and we had to be super efficient. And these practices stay with me today. Nowadays, we don't really have to. We have lots of memory, lots of storage, but computers still function and think in the same way. And, um, you know, efficiency in coding is super super important you know if, if anybody plays games or you know knows people that play games or has young people that play games and you hear them shouting because they're like oh it's lagging it's slow it's not working uh, often that's down to the the computation power of the machine but sometimes that can be down to inefficient levels of coding as well uh, so i just come with this very efficiency um, that comes with there and that's one particular approach one thing i didn't say at the beginning is that a lot of what I'm teaching you and showing you is is my approach. It is uh, quite a you know universally used approach, but uh, I'm also you know um, sort of uh, an old school coder as well who who does use a lot of modern methods, but some things are are rooted in um, that kind of uh, traditional kind of teaching methods. So let's do some global variables because. I might want to change them in the draw function. I might want to change them in the setup function. And I might even want to change them in the key press function. If I only put them inside the function draw as a variable, I cannot look at them anywhere else. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not, it, that's the difference between the global idea. Global variables are done right at the very top before we do anything else. So, this is, again, the first time we're going to write some code that's not inside any of these functions. So I, I'm just going to click at the very top before this function set up and press enter a couple of times and bring that down. And now on line one, I'm going to have some new stuff. OK, so we're going to have some variables and we're going to need to give them a name. OK, lots of other languages other than JavaScript 
like Java or C or Python, you need to tell the computer what type of variable that is. Is it a number? Is it a letter? Is it a word? Is it a binary byte? JavaScript, you don't need to do that, which is as well why it's a really cool language for getting started. But it's good to know that in your mind. We just need to tell the computer that we want to store a variable and I want to call it R because it's going to hold some kind of number. We do that. You might think we use variable. Remember what I said earlier, sometimes we're a little bit efficient, not lazy, efficient. So we're making it shorter and we just say var for a variable. I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to call this R because that's what I'd like to call it and put a semicolon at the end. I've now created this variable called R of which at any point, if I want to use that variable, I just use its name R. And if I want to change it, I can say R is equal to a specific number. Great. Let's go into our setup function and actually give R a number. In line eight, I'm going to say that R is equal to 255. Why not? R is equal to 255. So this is our first variable we've assigned it a value let's use that value now and in much the same way as when we change the number down here to use mouse x and mouse y let's say in the fill command here instead of writing 255 there i'm going to write the letter r variables are really useful in code because um imagine i've got lots of things in my code maybe my code is a million lines long and there's loads of times where i'm referencing that color i'd have to go through if i wanted to change that instead of being 255 if i wanted to change that to be 100 i'd have to look through every single bit and change it if i use this variable r I only have to change it here once and every other time I'm referencing it, it's going to get that value. So they're really useful for time saving. Let's run this code and see, we should have exactly the same. That's now 255 for the R. Okay, let, let's make let's make the other variables and and change those numbers to see and make sure that this, this concept is working because right now we have something the same. And so it, it may be difficult to understand what's going on. Let's do a var G on line two and on line three, let's do a var B. Now you could call these whatever you wanted, you know, um, call them googly if you really wanted to. But um, imagine you come back to this in, three months time and you look at that you might not remember what on earth it was all about so you could put a comment in there like i said before variable you could put a comment in there but what's really good practice is to name your variables you know realistic ideas of what values they're going to hold okay it make them make sense yeah that's what's really important Okay, uh, inside the setup then, I'm gonna say that G is equal to 255, and I'm gonna say that B is equal to zero. Why not? Just some arbitrary values. I'm gonna run this. Okay, hmm, it's still drawing it in pink. What have I not done? Okay, so I've, I've declared these variables, I've created them, I've given them values, but I haven't actually used them. Look, down here in the fill command, I haven't actually used them. So I need to use the R, the G, and the B. See now why I called them R, G, and B, because now it makes sense for where I want to use them. Now if I run this, ah, I've got a kind of yellowy color because I've got 255 red, 255 green, and no blue. All right, so this is definitely working. If I was to change this G value, I'm pretty sure if I run this, yeah, I've got an orange. Okay, so 
we know now that these variables are being created. We're giving them a value and we're using that value. Great, 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 great. Okay. So what we could do in the draw function is we, we, we set these to be a value in setup, which is once the function draw runs 30 times a second. So what if we were to say that R is equal to some random number? It would make it the random number, use the fill command and draw with that random number and then loop back round and choose a different one. And again, and again, this could be interesting. We might not want this to happen, but let's, let's, let's go with it for now. And then we can think about how we can add some more control. So I could say R is equal to, and instead of just giving it a number, let's use the random function. Okay. Random takes two numbers. It basically takes the low number and the high number of what you want your random to be between. So if we wanted to simulate a six-sided dice, you know, those boring coding things they make you do in school, we would say it's a random between one and six, and that would pick us a random number between one and six. We want to pick between naught and 255. I mean, we might want to not do that, but let's pick the whole red amount at the moment. Oh, okay, let's run this and see what happens. Now, it's possibly a little hard to see, but you can see that the red amount is fluctuating. Let's do this for the G and the B. So it's, so it's much easier to see that it's gonna randomly pick those. We just have to type the same again. G is equal to random between naught and 255. Semicolon. B is equal to random, not 255. Semicolon. Oh, okay. Let's run this code. We yes. Lots of random colors. Well, that's working really nice. If I hold it there, it's definitely going it through. I tell you what, this this opacity, let's let's just for a moment, let's make that a little bit more solid so I can really see this working. Oh, mind your eyes. Great. That's definitely a lot more interesting uh, and more fun. Great. Lovely stuff. It'd look a lot nicer if there wasn't that outline around it, I think. Um, so instead of this stroke weight three, um, you know, we, we could we could get rid of the uh, of the outline altogether. Um, you might think, oh, we can just put stroke weight naught in and then uh, we'll no longer have an outline. Excellent. You were correct. The other function we could do is we could just say no stroke, which actually turns it off uh, completely. But let's stick with the functions that we know now. Well, that's looking pretty nice. That That's pretty funky looking. Maybe let's put our opacity back to what it was at 30 on line 22. Ah, oh, yeah, kind of more pastel kind of watercolors and, and feel free to experiment and throw back in some of the other stuff. Why don't we have the shape changing based on the size of how big we're drawing? Ah, oh, nice. We've kind of built something in digital art that is uh, a semi-generative system. So generative art is where you create um, rules in the code that say to do something and the code uh, 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 kind of produces the work. Because we've got a combination of some uh, very basic generative rules, which is random numbers for a color, and the mouse that enables us to have some control, we've built a kind of semi-generative kind of system. Um, we have something that looks interesting. I'd be very interested to see um, what everybody else is uh, kind of making. Um, you can feel free to take a screenshot and, uh, you know, if you're going to post it on social media or anything like that, please use the digital democracies hashtag or feel free to, you know, respond via email threshold. We'd love to see some of the work uh, uh, and things that you've been making. I'm sure that you've been uh, experimenting and playing. Um, 
one of the things uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll do a rectangle instead. Let's uh, let's let's have a look at some of my wee rectangles. Maybe I'll um, make it change there. Let's make it a little bit more less. Oh, there we go. I don't know. You could. Uh... Okay, <laughs> whatever you uh, whatever you fancy doing. Um, I was going to put this back. One of the things that's uh, happening is when we click, the colour's constantly changing, constantly all the time. Oh, let me just check the chat in case uh, I just saw something pop up. Yes, I will paste the code into the chat, no problem at all. I think you can paste and chat in here, no problem. I think you can click the little three dots on the side and click copy and then pop it in. Yeah, that should work for you. Okay. One of the things that you'll notice is if I just click once, it'll quick, it'll pick the random color and drop it in. But obviously, because it's doing it 30 times a second, if I click too long, it's going to go through. What you might want to do is not have these three colors happen 30 times a second. You might want to uh, press a key to change the color, um, for example. So instead of it just constantly drawing and constantly updating, you might wish to just pop this into uh, the key pressed command um, instead. Uh, and instead of clearing the background, you could press the key and the, um, the, col the color would change instead if you wanted to do that. I won't show you that now, but I will pop that into the um, uh, into the, uh, the, the the handouts and stuff that come out afterwards as a bit of code for you to look through. One of the things that's really funky, though, is I just said, ah, oh, you know, take a screenshot, show us what you've been making. What would be really cool is if we were able to just output this canvas uh, as a uh, as a download, you know, uh, we could we could just click on here, press the key and it would download it as an image. The same as if, you know, when we're on the web and we right click and we go save images as. So, I mean, we can do this, this save image as, uh, which will save uh, this canvas, or we could start to get into the habit of how can code do that for us too. I'm just going to um, hang on a second just to allow um, to catch up and make sure that's working. Um, if you can let me know that hopefully that code is working for you, Rachel. Fingers crossed. Oh, I just closed the chat just after you said. Uh, okay, um, so it, on the chat, um, if you hover over my over that text that I sent you, on the right hand side should be three little dots that say copy. And then that should copy. And then if you you should be able to right click and paste into the editor. If not, let me know. Oh, uh, definitely think. Uh, really? That's very interesting. I can see it. I'm surprised. Should I try it to panelists and attendees? Let's try this. I don't know if that's does that work. Maybe I have to send it to panelists and attendees. Yes, okay. Uh, it's probably, it's the way Zoom does these things. You'd think that after a year of using these tools in a pandemic, we'd be au fait with them by now, but hey. Uh, so yeah, it's obviously attendees. So I was putting it in the wrong place. Awesome. Okay, I'll give you a second to just pop that in and make sure that's working for you. <clears throat> F 
fantastic. Great stuff, great stuff. What I'll do then is I'm just going to add in um, this uh, function. Like I say, you could right click and do save image as, um, and that will, you know, pop up and, and give you the chance to do, you know, my sketch. And then you could save and that would download and look, there's our output. So, you know, you can do that if you wish, uh, or we can add in a kind of uh, a spacebar press that would allow us to um, download that. I guess it does depend on what browser you're doing. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to adjust the code so that we can do it that when we press the key, when we press the spacebar key or any key, it will download it and then clear the background ready for us to work again. Because it's interesting to see how does this code kind of work and saves us having to right click. Also, if we're on a trackpad and we're trying to maybe right click and etc. So we're going to just drop in and change some of this code just a fraction so that we can download um, our wonderful masterpieces that we've been playing with. A couple of things that we just need to change to make this happen. Let me just file save. Couple of things then. This create canvas, uh, we need to have a global variable that we actually pass that into, and then we will be able to do the save function. So we're just going to get a, um, a global variable at the top. So I'm just going to say var uh, CNV, short for canvas. on line, which is now eight now, rather than just create canvas, I'm going to say CNV is equal to create canvas. So it's still going to do the same thing if we run this, but this canvas is now being stored in this variable. So whatever we're drawing onto this is being stored inside this CNV variable. Therefore, what I can do is I can call the save function, which initiates the exact same thing as if we'd right clicked and done a save as, and it will uh, save it into um, our downloads. So I'm going to come down to the key pressed function. And before we clear the background, I'm going to make it save it as a download so that we've got a copy of it. Then what we can do is we can draw, we can draw, we can press the space bar and it will download it for us and we've got a copy of it and then we've got a blank thing ready to go again. So it gives us a, a kind of a process. We're using the code to give us not only just a tool and a method for creation and play, but we're given a, a process tool as well. So with this one, um, we're going to add in the save, uh, saving the canvas. Hey, let's uh, let's go back to our reference just for a bit of help, shall we? Let's have a little look here on our reference. And uh, you know what? Let's try searching the reference to figure out uh, canvas. There we go. There's one called save. We'll, we'll be testing this out. Save canvas. Oh, wow. There's loads of ways we can do it. So let's do it where we can specify uh, the file name. This, this gives us an idea of how to do it. So the reference does give potentially too much information. Let's go with uh, the saving the canvas and giving it a file name too, because that's usually what happens when we download a file. So we'll say save canvas, left and right brackets and we go on. And inside the first parameter is the CNV, which is our variable that holds the canvas. Then I'm going to press the comma. And then now we actually inside single speech marks is where we want to say what the name of the file is. Oh no, my p5 pick dot jpg. And you've got to give it the file extension dot jpg for a jpeg, png, whatever you, you want to do. And so now that's actually going to be that th this code is the same as, as if we'd right clicked. So if I run this code, if I draw, 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 I'm going to click the space bar. It cleared the screen, but before it did, can you see in my downloads, it downloaded something called my p 5 pickjpeg And if I click that and have a look, there is my marvelous picture in a square all ready for Instagram later on. Great stuff. 
So we've, let's file save this. What we've got now is, is a tool for saving our pictures and our work. So now we can start to experiment and be like, mm, okay, what? Well, uh, maybe I want to draw a rectangle or maybe I'm going to do something else or maybe I'm going to always draw the circle in the middle of the screen, but I'm going to use the mouse to make it be a different size. And yeah, I'm just going to and play. I really don't know and yeah and now i'm happy with that and i'll press the space bar and save that and you'll see it's given it's saved it with the same file name but luckily um on a mac it gives it uh, an extra extension you may get a warning depending on what version of chrome what browser things like that it every time you try to you might do that a lot and it may say, you know, warning, this site is trying to download multiple images, etc. Uh, and you can just press OK on that. That's just uh, uh, an inbuilt web browser prevention to stop, you know, lots and lots of images from being downloaded because, for example, that could be a virus that's made that happen. So that's like an inbuilt thing. So if you get that, don't worry about that error. That's just, um, yeah, something like that. Okay, let's file save this. I'm going to uh, top up my water in a second. Uh, what we've got here then is, is we've got like a little system going on. We've got something that we can do. We can do random numbers. We can do put them in colors. Um, we can do, you know, the fact that if we're pressing the mouse, we've got little bits here that we could chop and change. I mean, we could have made another two variables. We could call them X and Y. And actually, instead of pressing the mouse to draw a circle, we could just randomly pick an X and Y position and it will draw the circle at that position. And it will just randomly keep drawing circles of different colors in different places. We could even have different sizes. That's something we could also play with as well. We wouldn't need any of this if statement at all. We could just have another two random numbers being stored in the variable and we could draw our circle at that position. Okay, just again going to take a little break to allow for people to play, explore, um, or also get yourself a little break. Uh, you know, I'm very conscious that, um, you know, uh, sitting at a screen, uh, we should take a, a little break every now and then, even just to stare off into the distance to make sure, you know, we focus our eyes. Um, but also that allows us to just think about what it is that we've uh, been learning. We're going to come on to manipulating images now. And, and what you're going to see is that a ton of all of the stuff we've learned so far, we can immediately apply to, instead of drawing a rectangle or a circle, we're going to draw a, a, a JPEG or a PNG on the screen and, and mess with it in exactly the same way. So if you want to, uh, if you happen to have a picture uh, on your screen or anything like that ready, I uh, happen to have a picture of my cat ready to go, uh, which happens to be a square picture uh, because it will fit the canvas nicely. Um, yours doesn't have to be a square picture, but you will notice things are different. Um, also a nice square picture. It'll be great for the socials later, then it will fit nicely. Just going to have a couple of minutes and then we're going to come back. But if you want to get yourself a picture uh, ready to go, that would be fantastic. OK, I shall pause there uh, and see you in a moment. Hope everybody's still OK. And uh, <clears throat> and still, still, still with me uh, and things like that. So we're going into our final kind of our final lesson. And then at the end, um, yeah, then we'll go into a kind of a, uh, you know, a Q and A troubleshooting, where to next, etc. Because this is just a taster and just an introduction, and you know, there's there's lots that could have been covered, but hopefully, like some of these modular bits will allow you to at least start to go away and experiment and explore, make some things, but also know where to go um, in case you want to, you know, do something else. Like, for example, uh, we haven't even covered uh, text, for example, being able to write uh, onto the screen. Um, again, you can look in the reference and take a little look, find um, something around text, and you can see 
oh, look, there's a function called text and I can write the text in and I'm positioning it at the X position and the Y position. So, you know, lots of things follow the same kind of uh, idea in the way in which um, I've been showing you um, today. OK, uh, I'm going to start something uh, new. Um, but some of this uh, functionality that we've been doing, uh, I'm going to recreate into um, into this into this third sketch. So I'm just going to make sure I file save, uh, file new, and I'm just uh, because we're going to be doing some funky things. Um, I'm going to rebring in the var cnv. CNV is equal to create canvas. Going to put the background command inside the setup. And have the function key pressed again. I could have copied and pasted this from before, um, but um, I have kind of like a muscle memory and also just, you know, get used to the habit of um, my P5P2. Very unimaginative uh, file names there. Okay, I just get into the habit of, um, yeah, creating um, from scratch. Um, it, it's it's the, uh, a method and a way in which I've learned. Um, by retyping. Okay, so this is going to be our third one. And in this one, we're going to be uploading an image and drawing with that instead. So we're going to create like an image drawing tool. So something a little different here. Because of the way the web works for security reasons, um, we're, we're going to have to upload our picture into, uh, into the P5 editor so that we're then able to reference it later. Uh, and so we're going to just uh, open up the sidebar, which we haven't done before. So right here above the number one, um, we've got this little uh, arrow box. And when you highlight over it, it goes yellow. And I'm just going to click this and you'll notice it opens up um, this sidebar called sketch files. And this isn't something I've um, kind of talked about, um, but the, the, the way the modern web works is usually a website is made up of three components. You have the HTML page, which is the main structure, the, the HTML page that documents the structure of what stuff is going on the page. You have something called a style sheet, a CSS, uh, which is how does that stuff look? How is that styled? And then you have the JavaScript page, which is the code for any kind of interactivity or, or, or anything that requires uh, code. Um, this editor kind of does all of those bits for you. Um, but, you know, if you're curious, you can have a little peek uh, and see the, the HTML code. Uh, and you can also take a look at the style sheet as well, if you so wish. Uh, but the main one we want to make sure we're on is sketch.js. So make sure that you don't click on the style sheet and come back and then start to type your code in here because it's not going to work. So we'll make sure we're in the .js, short for JavaScript, uh, which is our code. Anyway, while we're here, this is where we're able to upload images so that we can reference them. Now, one thing. Often when you download an image off the internet, uh, it's got really long file names sometimes. It's got, you know, letters and numbers and all sorts like that. Uh, you should rename that file <laughs> before we put it in here because you're gonna have to type that file name in and we want to be as efficient as possible and type the least amount of code. Hence my cat picture that I've got is called cat. <laughs> So yeah, it's worthwhile renaming uh, that picture. How do we upload those? Well, you can see here, it's, it's a little bit tiny, um, so bear with me, but um, I'm gonna just tap in a uh, double tap so that you can see. Where it says sketch files, we've got index.html sketch.js, we've got this little arrow just here. And if we click this arrow, we've got the ability to upload a file. I'll click that, I'll tap out. And the upload file gives you um, to drop files here. So you can drag and drop your file on, or you can click uh, and it will open up. 
I'm just going to move this out of the way. I'm going to click and drag and drop my cat picture onto the upload file box. Let's move that back. And uh, it gave a little tick. And hopefully that means that that has worked. Great stuff. We can also see it here on the left hand side in the list of files. So I know that that has actually worked. Let me just check cat picture. Yeah, there's my cat pic index and sketch. Okay, great. So it's uploaded um, my picture. If for some reason you didn't rename it, uh, you can actually click, hang on, let's zoom in. You can actually click on uh, the uh, the file name here and on the drop down, you can now rename it if you so wish. Okay. Once we've actually uploaded our picture, it's now available to us within our sketch. There's some code that we need to load that picture inside a variable, and then we can use that variable to then, uh, we can display that using a function um, that will then display the contents of that variable. So similar to the way we put the canvas inside a variable and then using the save command, we can extract that and save it as a picture. We need to do the same uh, with images. I'm just going to drop into the chat in case there's any problems. Ah, yes, certainly not a problem. Let me just show you that again, uh, Rosny. Right. So what you can do, let me come back. So it, we're in our normal sketch window. Just next to where it says sketch.js, below the play button, we can click to open the arrow so that we've now got a list of sketch files. Next to where it says sketch files, there's this tiny little drop down arrow here. It's not very big, I know. We click that and then we get the chance to upload file, which opens up this dialog box here. We can then drag and drop the file onto this box, or we can in fact click and it will open up our you know, window to find something. So we can click. Let's go to the desktop and I can click cat open and then that should start to upload the picture. You'll see a progress bar go across and you should see like a little tick icon when it has uploaded. I've actually got two copies now, so I'm just going to delete that so I don't uh, confuse. How's that? I'll just give you a second to make sure everybody has uh, got their picture uploaded. Okay, fantastic. All right then, so if everybody's got their picture uploaded, uh, that's great. What we can do is now look at creating a variable to hold that, then loading the image into that variable, and then displaying that variable using a function. I'm going to close that sidebar now so that we don't need that. We know that that's working. All right then. So uh, I'm going to on line two, I'm going to make a var. Um, I'm just going to call this IMG one short for image one, because we can load more than one. Um, again, you'll notice a lot of this code I'm teaching you is modular. You want one circle, three, 10, you can just copy and paste. Var IMG one. Now let's go into the setup. And I'm going to click on here. And what we're going to do is we're going to load that in. We're going to load the image in. So line seven, then I'm going to say IMG one is equal to load image inside the curve bracket semicolon inside here, inside the single speech marks, I write the name of the file. So this is why we renamed it. So I'm going to write in here cat.jpg. And so you write the name of the file. Okay. And if we run this code, hopefully we don't get any errors. 
and we should be loading that image into that variable, which is great. Okay, nothing's happening yet because we, we haven't told the, uh, the computer to use the function, but I'm mitigating any errors that might appear. So the errors that could appear here now is if we spell the name wrong. So I'm just gonna spell the file name wrong, for example, and try to run this code. Okay, here we go. And I got some crazy bunch of errors here um, inside the console. So that's where there might be a problem. Or if you've not done the correct extension. So maybe I thought it was cat.png. Nope, that's also an error. Okay, so you just want to be making sure before we continue any further that it's able to load that image in and not give us an error. Great stuff. And, and, and if we can't remember, we can just open the sidebar and just make sure it's there. Okay, great. So we've loaded that image in. Now we want to draw it on the screen. And uh, the way this works is um, it's, it's fairly similar to the way the rectangle function works, is that we draw it from the top left corner uh, and it draws the image out for us like a rectangle. So we have to specify the X and Y position, which is in the top, and then it will draw it out for us. Just for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna pick the middle of the screen. So inside the function draw, let's use the command. And it's actually image is the command. And it's gonna take in three things. The first thing is the variable which is img1. That's the actual thing we want to draw. Then it's the x position across and the y position down that is the top left-hand corner for our picture. So, I mean, you could pick 0, naught so it draws it in the top corner, but I just want to demonstrate by drawing it at 400, 400. So you can see there has my picture been bought in from the top corner. Well, that doesn't look like my cat. Okay, let's have a little think here. The image itself will be however big that image is. So that actual picture of my cat is 2000 pixels by 2000 pixels because I took it on a high definition. So that's way, way bigger than my canvas is. So I, I need to resize that picture to make it fit. Um, I'm actually just going to put mine in the top corner, not, not just so you can see mine's going to fill the whole thing. So I can start to see that there's my cat. And I picked a square per picture on purpose because we have a square canvas that's 800 by 800. So in a minute, you're going to see uh, if you don't have a square picture, you'll see something a little different. What I can do is add another two numbers, just like with the rectangle, where we specify the width of this image and the height of this image. So I can specify, like, say, 100, 100. So it's going to, if I, if I use my thumb to cover, to cover this bit up, these, these, these last four numbers are the same as drawing a rectangle, right? Start in the top corner and draw it by however many pixels wide, by however many pixels tall. So it's the same function as the rectangle. So uh, if I want this to fill the whole thing, I could make this 800 by 800. So start at 0, which is the top corner, and draw it 800 wide by 800 tall, that's going to fill the whole screen. Now, if you've got like a non-square picture, it's, it's potentially going to look a little bit squished, but you know, that's something that you can look at, you know, and of course you can squish it on purpose if you wish. Ray, let's draw it like that. I'm going to specify how many pixels tall and how many pixels wide. Let's have a think about some of the fun stuff we did in the last one then. Um, well, uh, uh, hang on. If we're specifying the exact coordinates to draw this, can I use my mouse instead? Yeah, yeah, we can. Um, for demonstration purposes, I'm just gonna make my cat picture a little bit smaller. 
But instead of drawing it at zero, zero, why don't I draw it at the mouse X position and the mouse Y position? Oh, now I'm no longer drawing with a circle. I'm drawing with a picture. So, so all of the stuff that we did before, like we can now do not with just basic shapes, but we can do with an image. Now, from an artistic point of view, if we happen to be, you know, a visual artist, graphic artist, designer, we can now start to do some fun, funky things with our pictures. You know, from, from a process point of view, you know, I can now start to draw with them and make new, new versions if I so wish. Sorry, I'm just going to draw lots of pictures of my cat now because that's funky and draw like a little... Uh, you get the idea it's the kind of the solitaire effect isn't it you know that we used to have dunk, 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 dunk. anyway sorry i'm having too much fun here um but you know we can now start to manipulate that uh we can totally do the same um you're gonna say to me yeah but what about color um does that mean the fill command will work unfortunately not because the fill command is for shapes but we could use the tint command, which is for images. So we could say tint and put in some numbers here now. So maybe, uh, I, I'm sorry for my cat, but maybe I want to set the tint to green. That now means that the picture has been tinted green. We'll find that it starts to run a little slow. Uh, on the computer because these are quite computationally heavy um, kind of things that can um, yeah be being done here but it's definitely something that you can play around with if you so wish does that mean we can use the random numbers of course we can so we could take all of the random numbers that we've done before and also apply that onto the images that we're uploading and playing with. So we can start to do some, some interesting, uh, interesting fun stuff. I'm gonna undo the tint command um, just because uh, I'm trying to live stream to you uh, and run this and I want this to stay uh, nice and fast. So we've now got the fact that we can draw uh, with our image and, and we can mix and match this with all the other stuff. So what you'll see is how did I get an image into the code it's really only three lines, a variable to set up the container, the load image command that loads that picture into that variable, and then this image command to display that image. So if we wanted another picture, the process is the same. Upload another picture, create another variable, load the picture into the variable, and draw that. So we could now start to collage stuff and we could start to do some digital collage in and actually we could maybe take something that we've created, maybe in Photoshop or something like that and save each one as a separate layer and then throw some randomness in so that it relayers it and positions it and get new kind of abstract interpretations of our work. Um, it's about thinking about how can we use code as a tool for expression um, as well as it is about, you know, what is the right code to do the right thing? You know, there's, there's a real element of experimentation and play. Talking about that, what I'd really like to do is um, many of you may have seen the sign up picture. Um, when we signed up to the workshop, there was a sign up picture of my cat, but it was like cut into lots of different squares that were rearranged. What I'm gonna do is just show you a slightly advanced kind of creative technique um, that does that so that we can uh, finish on something that's a little bit like kind of funky and reminds me of kind of, you know, 60s uh, painters who would, you know, cut up images into squares and then rearrange them to make new versions. I think that's an interesting use of all of the stuff that we've learned so far, where we can use random numbers, we can take a portion of an image um, because this is now on the onto our canvas. Let's take a portion of our canvas and move it around. So we're going to start to combine all of these kind of uh, thoughts and processes that we've done so far. Okay, um, and we'll do yeah. Let's do we'll do two types. Sure, why not? Hopefully, everyone's feeling confident and okay on this.
Let's do uh, two different versions. Yeah, why not? Just get my reference code up so that I... Uh, Yep. Okay. Let's do the uh, copy command, shall we? All right, then. We're going to just do a couple of new bits of code. Um, stuff that we haven't kind of um, looked at before as well. So I'm going to file save this. Grape dinosaur. Uh, this is just... Uh, dd3 underscore drawing with jpegs file save excellent excellent um and so that we don't recreate all of this again what i'm actually going to do is go file duplicate to make an exact copy of this sketch. Because if I was to go file new, not only have I got to type all this in again, I've also got to upload the picture. So I'm just gonna say duplicate, which will make a duplicate copy because it's definitely says copy here. And I'm just gonna rename it straight away as DD4 underscore uh, collage image. So that I've got both uh, both kind of versions. But again, uh, don't worry, because these will be shared with you at the end. OK, what I'm going to do then is uh, I'm going to think about things a little bit differently here. What we're going to do is we're going to display our image on the screen. And what we're going to do is we're going to then uh, use some random numbers to take a position and and take a square, like a rectangle of, of the canvas and move it to a new position. OK, so the last half an hour is going to be a couple of advanced techniques and, and thoughts. So um, I'll make sure there's some pause points, but this might be the bit that you might want to, you know, replay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to empty the function drawer at the moment. OK, so all I'm doing at the moment is uh, loading in the cat picture. And I'm actually going to draw it. Um, into the um yeah i'm actually going to draw it into the uh setup instead so image img one nor nor 800 800 so i'm just gonna it's almost like this is a background image okay so i'm going to load it uh, and draw it in except i can't because of course it won't have loaded fully Okay, so yeah, they made some changes, didn't they? Uh, okay, so there's a new thing coming on. Okay, so from security point of view, if we want this uh, image to be ready to be able to be used, there's something called a function preload. Um, if anyone's ever like right clicked on a website uh, and stuff, when um, or an or a website that's got like loads of images and stuff, you know, sometimes when you load it, it takes a little while to load or there's a load bar. It's because it's fetching all that information and downloading it before it can display it. Um, I was just trying to shortcut uh, <laughs> that process. Um, which I'm not going to be able to do. Uh, so rather than do uh, loads of stuff, I will just I will just put it back in the function draw, and then we'll manipulate it. We'll manipulate it afterwards instead. Um, I, at the end, I can talk about some of these kind of advanced techniques. The thing with coding, just as an aside, is there is always more than one way to display a cat. Um, sorry, there's always more than one way to do the same task, right? Um, sometimes it's what's the shortest code. Sometimes it's what's the most memory efficient. Sometimes it's what is the way in which I want to do this because it fits within my creative process um, and so on. And sometimes it's that's the syntax I've got to use. So that's the way I have to do it. So there's always lots of different ways of doing things. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go with this way for now. Okay. So what I can do is I can take a portion of this image 
and I can display it in a different place. OK, so what I want to do is I just want to demonstrate that uh, using like the mouse pointer. So I'm going to use the mouse to move over somewhere and it's going to select like a rectangle around that and display that somewhere else. So just to uh, give us a, a visual reference uh, on that one, let's draw a rectangle um, around the um, around the mouse pointer uh, and make it see through so that we can see through it, something that we've not done so far. Let's do a rectangle. I'm going to do this at the mouse X, mouse Y. Let's maybe make it a uh, 200 by 200, quite a big rectangle. And just before, I want to say no fill. So I don't want to fill it with a color, which will make it transparent. Okay. Yeah. So that's allowing me to move this kind of box around the screen. This is just here for me visually as a, as a kind of a, a tool and a thought process. When we know this works, we'll get rid of this. And what I want to do is I want to, as I'm hovering over, I want to get what's underneath and I want to display that uh, set of um, pixels in the top corner. OK, I want to kind of uh, move this around and put it in the top corner. OK. Just to start with. All right. So how am I going to go about doing this? Because, um, you know, there's many complicated ways of getting at pixels underneath. But there's a couple of really interesting short forms. Uh, I'm going to come into the reference so that you can kind of see. And let's take a look at the, the image. Um, there's a lot of interesting um, uh, things that are going to show us in here what we can do. Um, just going to have a quick look. Um, what we're going to look at is how we can use um, the get function. And the get function is really uh, very, very interesting because it gets a region of pixels from the canvas. So it because we've drawn our picture to the canvas, it's going to grab us a rectangular kind of selection of size. OK, uh, and so it should give us um, the exact kind of size that we width. Yeah, X, Y, width and height. Very, very interesting uh, set of stuff that we can do. This goes on into a whole lot of stuff around how we can build our own uh, filters, how we can uh, get at the, the actual color underneath, like uh, the actual pixel data of the color of the picture, and we can start to manipulate that. Um, but that starts to get a little bit complex. So wonder if there's something a bit easier um, and not that you would necessarily know this because it's it's not uh, uh, as obvious. But if I come back to the image, this is what we've been doing so far. Display an image in the top corner. Display an image and I can set the size of it. Great. Fantastic. 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 Uh, I'm wondering if there's anything else that can do something. OK, this starts to look like it's doing something here. Take a specific position and place it somewhere else that might kind of work so what we can actually see here is that the image command can also have like eight numbers going on that sounds like something we want to do so right here if we're just using the image with four numbers that's saying top left corner for the x and y bottom width bottom height how wide do we want to draw that? If we use this with um, a bunch of other numbers, we can, uh, it basically says, take that portion and put that portion somewhere else. It's not as intuitive, okay? Which is why I'm putting this in right at the end when we've had a chance to play with some slightly more easier stuff. I'm just gonna put some code in for now. It's not gonna do what we want, but it's to demonstrate. So I'm gonna say image, IMG1. And I'm, what I want to get is I am going to get the uh, 400, 400. And I would like it to be uh, 200 by 200 wide. So I'm basically um, 
going to get this kind of square around here where the mouse is. And I want to put it in the top corner and still keep it 200 by 200. OK, I've left a little gap here, and this is where we need to potentially do something uh, to make a comment. But if I run this, what's happened is it's taken this top set of things, 0, 0, 200, 200, and placed it here, 400, 400, 200, 200. OK, so I've actually got them the wrong way around. So that's fine. Let's, uh, let, let's do that the other way around. Uh, so... That should be naught, naught. That's the destination, and this is the source. Let's do that the other way around. Kikoki. Okay. The problem is, is how big did I say my image was? It's two thousand pixels by two thousand pixels, which is really like. Ah, the numbers are not necessarily going to match up. So that I there, where that I is, is probably like quite, quite far away. So if I want to put that in the top corner, I, I've got to remember that the, 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 the image is 2000 pixels wide. So if I want the middle, I need to be at like 1000 by 1000. There we go. We can see that that's kind of got where the mouse pointer is. So we're going to have to do something that's um, not necessarily quite right, because if I just put the mouse X in here and the mouse Y and run this, although that the mouse is over this part of the cat, that's not relative to... There we go. There's a good demonstration. There's the box showing where the mouse pointer is, but that's that's where the ear is because the picture is 2000 by 2000. So we're going to have to kind of do uh, a little bit of maths. And, and this is not necessarily going to be the same for, for each of your pictures, um, because we're going to need to think about the fact that the, the, the mouse is currently going from like the width of the canvas, which is naught to 800, and our picture goes from naught to 2000, which is, is not right. Um, nobody, especially after having listened to me for like several hours, is gonna be wanting to do that kind of maths thing. So I'm gonna show you something that uses some local variables and a function that will take a range of numbers and move it to a different range of numbers, rather than resizing my entire cat picture re-uploading it again all the rest of it let's 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 leave that as and let's use some code to uh to to figure that out okay um we can use the the the, the numbers or we can get the value of the image so we're going to make some little variables here um i want uh, the image kind of x and the um yeah the image x so i'll use ix and it's equal to and i'm going to use this function called a map and the map function takes a variable and it takes the range that it normally comes in so say a variable goes between 0 and 1 and i want to make it go between 0 and a thousand and it does all that scaling and numbers and maths for us which is really great so I'm wanting to use the mouse X and I know it goes between 0 and 800 because that's the width of the, uh, of the canvas. And I'd like it to instead go between uh, 0 and the image one dot the width of the image. Okay. Now I could have put like, um, I could have put 2000 in here because I know that my picture is 2000. But what if uh, you upload a different picture or what if you don't know the width of the picture? Stuff like that. OK, and then instead, I'm going to use this IX value here. Now, the maths may not be purely quite accurate enough, um, but uh, hopefully they're going to be slightly more accurate now so hopefully if i go left and right 
yeah, that's not too bad. So like, there's my mouse pointer. If I go over to the eye, that's not too bad. Maths might need to be a little bit different. But you can see that hopefully, um, yeah, it's not it's not too bad in terms of the the mapping. <laughs> the the Y function is certainly not right. So let's let's duplicate this as well. Var i y is mapping the mouse y going between uh, naught and eight hundred. We're going to fix that in a second. Img one dot height. So the height of the image. All right. Hopefully now. I've got something that's a little bit more accurate. Not quite, not quite. Okay. It's still not quite right. Any thoughts as to why it might not be quite right? Uh, and this, this is sort of complex at the last part of the day. And, and I'll, I'll tell you the answer. And that is because the mouse value does not go between 0 and 800. Our, our, our canvas is between 0 and 800 there on the screen, but our mouse actually goes from 0 to whatever the width of our screen is. Yeah, whatever our entire screen width is. Um, so it's not actually 800, it's the width of our screen, um, which we can use the window width. I'm just gonna have to move this over so that that fits. And we can use the window height, which should be more accurate because our mouse goes all the way over here to the, uh, goes all the way over to the left, like our mouse is all the way over here, right? And that's still being picked up. So this should be hopefully a little bit more accurate. But again, it depends on your window, whether you're full screen, or whether your height and things like that. So you may have to adjust uh, some of these numbers to get that accurate. Um, but at the moment, um, yeah, it's really not working for my picture because it's not it's not getting the correct values. Um, but it, it, it's something that you can experiment with. Like I said, uh, uh, creating um, that kind of picture was um, was through trial and error and experimentation. What you've kind of got is a sort of Adobe Zoom <laughs> in a way. I mean, it's not lined up correctly. Um, but you've sort of got a little kind of zoom function here uh, with this with this kind of square um, that would enable you to uh, look around. And of course, creatively, we've taken a section that is oh, didn't use that variable. We've taken a section that is there. We go. That is more like it now. We've taken a section that is two hundred by two hundred and placed it exactly two hundred by two hundred. But there was nothing to stop us from messing with that. We could have taken this 200 by 200 square and made it be 400 by 400. So I, I'm gonna take this tiny little square here and I'm gonna blow it up and make it even bigger um, and lay it over the top. So now I've got a, a crazy zoom. Sorry to my cat there. Um, you know, and we could have done something like we could have squished it, we could have redone it. So take take a perfect square, but maybe let's make it be like, I don't know, a line instead so that we can move around. Um, it, it's just about manipulating shapes and things like that. Just, we can't take this and put it inside a circle. Um, it's just rectangles at the moment. And that would enable us to, um, yeah, we we can play and start to get some some different kind of interesting ideas if we were to move along uh, and and you know and relay this out. So what I did with with the with the picture for the um, for the for this workshop was actually to just go and take lots of these squares uh, and kind of line them up um and and repeat it again and again uh, rather than using the mouse i could in fact use uh, a random position um instead rather than necessarily um selecting this so of course you could instead of using this mouse position we could of course have had like a huge uh, random position uh, instead and there's nothing to have stopped us making it smaller 
no, uh, I'm zooming in and now I'm decreasing as well as uh, making that kind of bigger. So it's, it's just how can we uh, just use some numbers and some code to do something like, you know, a little bit different. We're getting this, we've got this kind of process and pipeline, um, you know, that goes through uh, there. I'm just going to make sure that nothing's in the chat that anybody error line 13 uh, da, 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 da. Uh, for Rachel sorry uh, I've only just noticed that and that was like 30 minutes ago so apologies Rachel um, what I might do uh, Marta if possible is we could switch it so that uh, if people wanted to ask questions and things uh, we could start to look at that uh, um, in a moment if people wanted to. One of the final things I just wanted to kind of say is that if we want to share this anywhere uh, so that people could see our work and stuff, we've got a variety of ways of doing this. What we can uh, do is firstly uh, make sure we're saved, is if we go to file and share, it comes up with a series of options of which we can share this with people. The main thing is the embed code at the top. If we were to uh, click, uh, you'll see it says it's copied to the clipboard. iframes are how we, uh, they're a bit like a picture frame that we put in our website with other content inside it. It's how you can embed like YouTube and, you know, and various other things and have them inside your site. So you could take this entire code and pop that inside. So if you use Squarespace or Wix or, or any of these others, or even if you use WordPress, you're allowed to put your own code in anywhere that allows you to put your own code. You could use that embed and then that entire, um, this entire sketch will be put inside uh, that website. If you wish to use the edit, which is actually this code on the left hand side as well, uh, which does mean that somebody would be able to edit your code, uh, which is not necessarily what you want to do, um, but you could share that too. Uh, and if you wanted to share it in full screen as well, uh, you could share that link too. Uh, and so, for example, if I copy this, if I copy this link and put it in the chat, which I'm going to do right now into the chat. Panelists and attendees. If I put that link into the chat, you will be able to click on that link and it should show you this cat thing that I've just made in full screen in a new tab for you to edit and play with. Um, but what it will do is it will, um, yeah, it will give you the chance to be able to play with stuff. So you can show your work without ne necessarily letting anybody edit your work, right? So that it's not too, uh, too bonkers. Yeah, so yeah, uh, I'm just gonna give it a second then for the Q&A uh, to come in. Um, Cause we've got a few minutes and then at the end, I'm going to, uh, you know, if we, if we've not got any of that or if we have or whatever, uh, I'll talk about next steps and where you might like to go next. The plethora of things that you can do with this. I mean, we've just got started. I mean, I've been teaching processing for, uh, and P5JS for years. Um, and you know, there's, there's many, many things that you can do with this, uh, tons of interactive stuff um that can be made very complex things and i'm more than happy to show some things and some code uh that i've made uh to give some kind of you know ideas and aspirations as well along with um with some of the stuff what i'll do is i'll pause for a second then uh, marta and i'll come back uh with a full glass of water ready for some more talking because you've all heard my voice so much you can't get enough of it <laughs> all right back in a second
Right. Well, we have nothing in the Q&A, which is good in a way, I suppose. And nothing in the chat. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I guess. I guess uh, that will be the kind of end of this introduction. I guess for going forward, um, definitely check out the, the P5JS website. Uh, where there's a lot of, um, you know, other kinds of, uh, there's examples, there's references there that you can open up and you can kind of play with the code. I mean, even within, let me just file save, uh, even within here, if we click file and examples, there's a lot of example collect, uh, you know, kind of set of a few ideas here where you can have a little bit of a play. There's a bunch of, uh, bunch of stuff here. Some are easy some are not um but yeah there's a plethora of stuff that's been created by a lot of people that will give you um some extra stuff to have a play with and see what's possible uh code academy have uh, uh some p5js stuff as well um and also um the uh open processing uh, is a website where a lot of people upload and share their code as well. The great thing about Processing and P5 is that there's a really good, strong community because it's open source. There's a lot of people who share code, help each other out, uh, things like that. So you'll find there's a really vibrant community uh, of people that use this. And um, yeah, and often there's kind of uh, events and workshops that are being held uh, that you can uh, drop into as well. So if you want to uh, learn and do more, then that's absolutely fine. If if people want more of this kind of stuff, um, you know, learning creative coding, um, feel free to pop that in the um, in the feedback. Um, you know, if if it's like, where do I go next? You know, there's 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 plenty of ways we can go next, you know, including how do we embed this, you know, uh, as backgrounds on our web page if we want interactive backgrounds, you know, how can we go further with this to do some really kind of high end interactive stuff. Um, yeah, the, it's just the beginning. Yeah. And and there's many things you can do. Hopefully one of the main things is thinking about um, structurally how these kinds of things work it's also thinking about the language as well like being able to have that confidence to communicate um as well some of those thoughts and ideas and it's also thinking about well here's what i want to do and finding the kind of syntax to help you make uh, that choice and that decision as well so yeah uh thank you so much for joining me this afternoon i hope everyone's had fun i hope they've been experimenting and playing with all different kinds of colors shapes interactivity uh looking forward to seeing some interesting uh pictures and things that you've made um yeah uh feel free to share with the hashtag um and um i think it's over to you marta but i am also more than happy you know if we're if uh, for to stick around and um, and speak to anyone uh, specifically as well if they so require. I guess I should stop screen sharing and jump back into the chat. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Don't forget to do your feedback and uh, and don't forget to keep an eye on the uh, the Threshold Studios and the Digital Democracies website as well for future other kinds of uh, yeah great events that are happening soon as well. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care.